are reading from first John 2, 18 to 27. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the, uh, that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know in the last hour they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the, from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do, because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie come, comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus, Christ, Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has a Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has a Father also. As for you, See that, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it, if it does, you also will, will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is that he promised us, eternal life. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as the anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it taught you, remain in him. Great reading, thank you, Joey. Um, that is quite a passage. It is, uh, I find it quite, uh, quite complex, dense. There's a lot in there and a lot to think about. Um, we're not going to unpack all of it today, but uh, you're welcome to turn your Bibles to this passage, First John chapter two, uh, verse eighteen to twenty-seven. And we, we're just going to, I'm just going to pick out two relevant points from that today that uh, for us to focus on, uh, because there, there is so much to un unpack. Uh, last time I spoke was uh, in January. We looked at the verses preceding this, in verse 15 to 17. I talked about don't look up, uh, where we were warned about the desires and the distractions of this world that takes our eyes off Christ, that the things that prevent us from looking up. And this kind of carries on on that theme. I shared about uh, the movie, Don't Look Up, which is about the end of the world, an asteroid coming to destroy it. And this passage starts off kind of continues on that theme in verse 18 when it says, Dear children, this is the last hour. So we'll come back to that uh, promptly, uh, to this, uh, this last hour concept. Uh, but first, let's, let's talk about the Antichrist. And uh, if you like sermon titles, uh, today's title is, it's a bit like these Marvel comics battles or, you know, what's these movies typically called? Like Spider-Man versus Batman, or you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. So it's a bit like this. So this is Antichrist now versus Christ for eternity. Okay. So that's it for today. The big battle. <laughs> well, end game. Yes, the end game. Uh, even better title. I shouldn't write titles. Well, I should ask. I, I should ask Danny. <laughs> so. It starts here in verse 18. It says, even now, many antichrists have come. Now, this is interesting. This whole concept of the antichrist. In the religious world, many people have written many books trying to figure out who is this antichrist. And usually the conclusion they come to is that it is some radically evil character. Someone that the whole world despises. Someone like... What was that Dolson thing? I, I didn't get that much for that one at first. Like, what's that about? Hitler, Hitler, Finn. And then my wife helped me out and said, no, Adolf, 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 Finn. Adolf, Finn. You didn't get it either. That's, what, that's why we have wives to help us out. You know? That's why God said, men, you need a helper because you're like, in, duh. So there you go. Normally, the conclusion is something like the Antichrist is Hitler, or the Antichrist was Pol Pot, some, some genocidal maniac, some, somebody extreme that the whole world, everybody thinks is evil. But what's interesting here, he says, even now, many Antichrists have come. He says, there are many. And if we read on, we see that the definition here is not nearly that extreme. In verse 22, he says, Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. Wow, that's quite radical. 
So the Antichrist is anybody who denies Jesus and who denies God. Now, we can take this to the extreme as well and say, okay, well, so if we walk out here on the street, it won't take us 10 minutes to find an Antichrist because there's a lot of people walking around Watford who don't believe in Jesus or who haven't accepted Jesus or who don't believe in God even. And I think the important context here is in verse 19. It says, they went out from us. And I'm not going to go into all the detail now of the, of the context of the whole of the letter of John. And there's a lot of things at play here, which is false teachings and, and divisions in the church that John is, uh, is, is warning against. And specifically here, he is talking about uh, those who were part of the church, Christians, who then left and started opposing the apostles, and who started opposing the, the, the very basics of the gospel. That, that is what he's talking about here. So I probably won't be so extreme to say, well, anybody out there who doesn't believe in Christ is the Antichrist. Certainly, there are many of those who have heard, who have believed, and then rejected Christ after coming to faith, who turned their back and walked away. Those who have chosen deliberately against Christ John calls them, that is the Antichrist. That is kind of, wow, that, that's intense. But that's kind of a warning for us as well. It's like in, Jesus said, you are either for me or you are against me. And if we are not 100% for Christ, if we turn our back on Christ and we walk away, we are effectively becoming the Antichrist that he warns, that he warns against here. I would not group those who have not been presented to the gospel yet. You haven't given, been given the opportunity to say, let me tell you about Jesus Give them an opportunity to learn, to get to know Jesus, to find out who he is, and accept him. I would not put them in the same pot and they say, oh, well, that's also the Antichrist. Uh, the context here is something different. It's those who walked away. So I think that's, a, that's a just an important bit of teaching to, to understand. Uh, what is the Antichrist? But it is that the ones that deny the very basics of the gospel, that Jesus was sent to this earth, who is the Son of God, that he died and he was resurrected. Back to verse 18, the warning where he says, Dear children, this is the last hour. It's back to that context of the end is coming soon. It's the last hour. Now the cynics would say, oh, hang on, how long ago was this written? How long ago did John write this roughly? That he said this is the last hour, was it? 2,000 years approximately, maybe a little bit less than 2,000, but rough, rough enough. Yeah, about 2,000 years ago. Like in 2,000 years ago, this is the last hour. It's like in, okay, how much longer are we going to wait? Ah, what a load of nonsense. I mean, surely, if you said this is the last hour and Jesus didn't come back, then maybe it's not true after all. We need to understand the perspective of eternity and eternal life and God's time versus our time. And it's very relevant to the whole message that John is trying to give us here. So if we think about the age of the universe, so let me ask some of these clever kids. You're welcome to Google it if you have your phone with you, or ask your parents if you don't know. Uh, I wonder if they would know. Anyway, <laughs> we'll any of the kids here know how old the universe is? Roughly. Yes. 13 billion years. Yeah, what do you think? 14, yeah, so if you round it, 14. Four, four zero. Yeah. yeah, so it's, 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 uh, it's actually closer to, to uh, when you said, I thought you said 14, I was like, yeah, it's actually kind of in the middle between you two. Depends how you calculate it. Some would say 13 and a half, some would say 13.8. Let the scientists argue about that. I mean, what's half a billion years between friends? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like <laughs> roughly 14 billion years. Let's say 14. Now, if we think of the universe as having existed for 14 billion years, it's, it's hard to get our minds around big numbers like that as humans. Uh, now, I don't want to get into the whole evolution debate, etc., but uh, roughly how long have humans been, as a species, been on this earth? Anybody know? 100,000. Any other takers? Okay, so that's roughly what the scientists say. Some say 200,000, some say 30,000, depending on how you classify species, if you see Neanderthal man as homo sapiens, human or not, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But say, let's say roughly about 100,000. Now, as humans, we've existed for 100,000 years. 
Does that sound like a long time? I don't know, it depends what's long. I mean, I've lived for only 26 years. Is it how old are now? 28, is it? <laughs> <So> <laughs> if I think about how long I've lived, it's like around a thousand years is a very long time. But if we think about humans have only been on this earth since God created us and put us here for 100,000 year, years, how, how much is that compared to 14 billion years? It's about 7,000 times. Now, 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 how do you imagine that kind of... Does anybody have anything... How, how big is or thick is a millimeter? Let me, the kids. Does anybody have something that's roughly a millimeter thick with them or something I can just use? Strand of my hair? That's a little bit thinner than a millimeter, I think. A nail? A nail, probably about a millimeter thick. Yeah. So let me see if there's anything here. Your plectrum. Can I, can I borrow your plectrum? If I know what a plectrum is. Is this it? That's a plectrum, okay. So can anybody see how thick this is, roughly? Roughly about, that's about a millimeter. Okay, so. If, if we think this is a millimeter, then the Earth, or, or the, the universe, compared to that, would be seven meters. So that means, if the universe... So in distance-wise, if the universe started here, the creation of the universe, and I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This bit here, that's how long we've been in existence as humans. Just this thin little slice. Everything between here and there is almost nothing. To get our minds around that, it's like in, every time I think about that, it's like in, Wow, that is, that is complicated. We are actually quite insignificant in this universe. So when John writes here and says, this is the last hour, then compared to this like in 100,000 years, 4 billion years, 14 billion years, then 2,000 years ago, I mean, that is like an hour to God. It's nothing. It's not even as thick as that little plectrum. It's not even as thick as my hair. So whether it's an hour or two hours or 2,000 years, in God's time, it's all the same thing. And this scripture is as relevant to us today as when it was written 2,000 years ago. When John says, this is the last hour, it is today. We are still in this last hour. It's not still to come. It's not past. It is now. It is, it is the context and the world and the time that we live in right now. And this warning of John, of this is the last hour, it is important that we understand that what is important in this life is to think beyond just this life. And it tries to get us to focus our eyes and our hearts and our minds on eternity, on bigger things than just this life. So in verse 25, he says, and this is what he promised us, eternal life. How do we wrap our minds around that? I mean, we struggle to comprehend our little millimeter compared to seven meters, our little life on this earth compared to 14 billion years. How do we even imagine eternity? The only way to do that is to get out of the bounds of this earth where people have debates and fights about how long will the earth survive and is the climate crisis going to kill it and et cetera, et cetera. It's like, in, this is all material. We are just matter. We're space dust. We need to think beyond that. We need to think like outside this material world. Now, here's an interesting thing. Now, you may feel uncomfortable or you may not. If you feel uncomfortable, don't participate. Nobody will judge you. But who here believes in ghosts? Okay, so we've got a few. <coughs> Why am I asking this question? Beggy is like, mm, I don't know. Yeah, Maybe, well, I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, those of you, if you do believe in ghosts, it's okay. You're in good company. The apostles believed in ghosts. They did, yeah. 
what, what did they say when they saw Jesus walking on the lake in the storm, coming to them in the boat? Does anybody know? I thought he was a ghost. Mark 6, verse 49. It says, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. Now, we know these apostles were ordinary, unschooled men. That's what the Bible tells us, and that's what the Romans saw them. It's like, you know, these are just ordinary, unschooled men. It's like, and yeah, of course, they believe in ghosts, but not us clever people, not us scientists. Same thing happened when Jesus appeared to them the first time after his death. In Luke 24, they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. Again, what a bunch of superstitious disciples, like and pff, pff, believing in ghosts. They go, oh, it's a ghost. How did Jesus respond? Two verses later, Jesus appears to them. they frightened. They think they see a ghost. Jesus replies, he says, look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Bill says he believes as well. How do we how, how, how do we conclude that? Well, what would if Jesus have said otherwise? It's like an oh, come on, guys, you know there are no ghosts. I mean, Jesus was the preacher of truth. Surely he would have corrected the disciples. The first time when he walked up to them on the lake, to the boat. The second time when he appeared to them and they said, It must be a ghost. Surely he would have corrected them and said, No, 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 there are no ghosts. He said, no, no, you just need to understand there's a difference. Humans, flesh, body, ghosts, spirit. No flesh, no body. So Jesus clearly, my conclusion is that Jesus believed in ghosts, as the apostles did. And part of this concept of understanding and relating and desiring eternity and eternal life, and this, this promise of eternal life, is to switch our mind from antichrist material world thinking to Christ spiritual thinking. And some of this sometimes stuff is sometimes a bit weird for us. It's hard for us to wrap our brains around it. It's like, an, hang on, hang on a bit. This is all a bit airy-fairy for me, or, or, or we struggle to relate to it. But that is really the core message here is that we need to shift our minds to eternity. And eternity, the eternity promised to us, is, to a large part, spiritual eternity. Because everything that's material in this universe is in a state of decay. And all the scientists don't agree about everything, but that is one thing that every scientist agree with, that the entropy in this universe means everything is in a state of decay. Everything is slowing down, cooling down, and eventually will either come to a standstill or die, and there will be nothing but dead molecules in this universe, scientifically. But spiritually, eternity goes beyond that. How do we shift our minds from this material thinking to spiritual thinking? First of all, we have to believe it. It's important for ourselves to desire and to know that there is something after this life. And ghost is part of that world, like angels. It's all like in, what? Really? Serious? But it's important that we buy into that, have conviction about it, and truly believe that we have a spirit that lives beyond this body. I listened to a podcast last year, which really inspired me. And then uh, I bought the book, and I started reading this book. The book is called After. And it is written by... Um, Bruce, uh, let me just get his name again. <laughs> Bruce Grayson. So, Dr. Bruce Grayson. What's that? Did I miss something? <laughs> Bruce Almighty, ah! <laughs> well, it's like, in, yeah, Bruce Grayson, Bruce Almighty. So, Dr. Bruce Grayson. Let me tell you who he is. Dr. Bruce Grayson is Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. Um, 
so Dr. Grayson started off with, as a, as a young psychiatrist, uh, he's, he grew up in a household that were kind of agnostic, very scientific household, parents are scientists, and he himself grew up basically as an atheist and as a complete non-believer in anything spiritual. He studied psychiatry, and then in the introduction to this book, he tells the story that completely rattled him. And basically how the story goes, it's, it's a bit long, so I'll, I'll tell it in my own words. He was a, he was a young intern as a psychiatrist uh, assigned to the emergency ward on his, uh, on his first rotation after qualifying. And this is about uh, 50 years ago, so in the 60s. As a complete unbeliever, it's like him, he's just, he wanted to understand the human mind, how the mind works, how the brain works, and everything. So he studied neurobiology, became a psychiatrist. So a psychiatrist, as opposed to a psychologist, a psychiatrist is a medical doctor who then specializes in mental health. Is that right, Charles? Did I describe that correctly? Okay, so um, that's what he studied. He was assigned to the emergency room, and one night, uh, a young student brought her friend into the emergency in a coma. She thought the, the friend had a drug, took a drug overdose. Uh, him as being a psychiatrist, and because it was suspected drug overdose, he was assigned with the clinical people to, to her case. When she came into the emergency room, he was uh, sitting in his office, quickly eating dinner. Now, this is an important part of the story. He was eating a spaghetti bolognese, and as he was eating, he, he messed some ketchup on his shirt. So there was a red uh, stain on his shirt. So he got beeped on his uh, beeper, it's old technology, some of you may, may know that uh, today. Let's, let's say he got an SMS <laughs> calling him to this emergency in the emergency room. And he was like, oh, I messed on my shirt. And he quickly put on a, a white overcoat to cover the stain on his shirt, so he would look professional. Goes to the, to the emergency room and uh, to see what the situation is. So there he meets this girl called Susan, the student who brought in her friend in a coma. And he asks, okay, what's the situation? And she explains she found her friend passed out when she got home, called the ambulance, they came and fetched her, they suspected drug overdose. And she said, okay, well, can we go and see her? So they went into the ICU where she was all wired up with all the equipment and everything in a coma. She tried to speak, he tried to speak to her, uh, did the normal tests. There was no reaction, no response or anything. So he told Susan, her friend, he said, okay, there's nothing more for us to do here. I'm a psychiatrist. I need to know, know a bit more about her history. So are you willing to, to share anything with me that you know? And she said, yes, I'll tell you what I know. I only met her two months ago because we moved together into the same dorm room, first year of university. They go out to uh, like an interview room, they call it a family room, uh, where the psychiatrist takes off his coat. He says, oh, sorry for the stain. Um, it was hot, it was summer. Takes off his coat because he's warm. He said, oh, sorry for the stain. I missed some ketchup on my shirt. Uh, do you mind if I ask you some questions? So he asks Susan about her friend's history and, and finds out, oh, she, she's been suffering from depression and she had some medication for it and she, she doesn't know what happened, but she just found her there. But that is her history. The only thing she knows is that she has this history of, of, of using drugs and, and being on medication. A few more questions and that's it. She says, that's all I know. Okay, she says, okay, you can go home. I'll be in touch. So the psychiatrist writes up his report speaks to the, to the ICU doctor and says, anything here for me? He says, no, she's in a coma, she's not responding. Uh, come back tomorrow and then we'll see how, how things have developed. Now, listen carefully. Next day, he goes in and he speaks to the doctor on duty and the doctor says, oh yeah, she's recovered, she's out of her coma, she's aware and awake. She can speak to you. He says, oh, that's great. He walks into the ICU room and he says, oh, good morning, uh, Catherine. Now, Susan is the friend. Good morning, Catherine. Um, I'm a psychiatrist and, and uh, I was just wondering how you're doing. I would like to speak to you. And she looks at him and says, yeah, I know who you are and I know why you're here. 
And he says, oh, how do you know? Did they tell you that I'll be seeing you? She says, no, 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 I saw you last night. He said, what do you mean I saw you last night? No, I, I know I saw you, but you were not responding or anything. He says, no, she says, no, I saw you in that other room with my friend Susan. He, uh, so he asks her, how did you see me? Because you were on, she says, no, she, she doesn't know how I, I saw you, but I was there in the room with you. You had a, a red stain on your shirt. And then you ask Susan some questions. You ask her, and then you ask Susan about my history and if I was suffering from depression. And, and she, she listed six questions, which she asked her friend. And he was like, in, did anybody tell you about this? She said, no, nobody told me. I was there. He just shook his head and, and, and kind of said, no, this is impossible pushed it aside, and started kind of going through his protocol of assessing her and asking, going through her history and, and everything. And, and being a non-spiritual person, he kind of put it aside. He went home that night, and he thought, how is this possible? How can this person who was there, almost dying, have seen me in another room and seen something which nobody else could have, see, could have seen. It was only me and Susan who saw that stain on my shirt. He put it completely out of his mind because he was like in so caught una- off guard by this that he's like, okay, shall I speak to my supervisor about this? Because he was an intern. Later that day, he saw his supervisor and he thought, no, no, I can't discuss this with him. I mean, this is not academic. This is too weird. This is completely out of this world. And he put it aside. For 10 years, this thing was eating at him. 10 years later, he was the professor in a similar department, supervising other interns. When one of his interns had a similar experience, we're not going to go all the detail now. One of his interns had a similar experience, but he had the courage to come and speak to him and say, you know what? This happened today. On my... I had this patient, they were close to death, they were almost dying, they were in a coma, and they had X experience. And that awakened within him. It's like in, for the first time he shared, he said, you know what, same thing happened to me 10 years ago. The difference was this student of his, this intern, actually was studying this thing, which he, in, and he came up with a name called near-death experiences. And he started doing academic studies about it. And because he, re- he suddenly realized, he said, you know what? I experienced this, and the student experienced it. And then the student told him about, he already collected about 40 other similar cases. And he said, let's start studying this. And for the last 40 years, Bruce Grayson has been studying near-death experiences. People who come back from death, come back from death or near death, and tell stories that are amazing that goes your mind, makes your mind go, what? Did I hear that correctly? How did that happen? Is that even possible? And he wrote this book called After, about the life after this life, about the spiritual world, about the things that happen that is so much more important than this world that we live in. If you struggle with these ideas, with these concepts, uh, I would definitely encourage, uh, come to me, I'll give you the reference. The book is called After by Dr. Bruce Grayson. Um, it will help you to, to get into touch with the reality of the spiritual world and the fact that we're not just bodies. We're not just animals walking on this planet. We have a spirit, a spirit that longs for life beyond this life, that longs for eternal life. And that is what John says He says, and this is what Jesus promised us, eternal life. That is what Christ is about. That is what our Christianity is about. And that is what makes the difference between having a meaningful life in this world. Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. If all we live for is this life, and we say, oh, I love Christ, and Christ is so great, and I I model my life after Christ, and I want to live like Jesus, 
Well, good luck with that, because I can tell you what, it's pretty hard living like Jesus. <laughs> if you're only doing it for this life, you're going to be disappointed. Yeah, in fact, Paul says, you know what, you're better off to go and live like the world. Just go eat, drink, be merry, enjoy yourself, get the most out of this life, because that's all you have. But if you believe in more than this life, if you believe in Christ, like we shoot for more than this life, that is what makes the difference. That longing, not just for eternal life, but also for reconnecting with those souls that left this earth. I find comfort in that. And maybe it'll be helpful for us to think about that more often, about eternal life, about life after this life. I sometimes think about who I hope to see there. First of all, I hope to make it myself. But by the grace of God, if I do get to be there in heaven, I think about my mom's been away for a year and I miss her still so much. How I long and hope to see her there. Friends, school friend of Lila myself that was run over by a car in the street. 15, how old is uh, um, Chart, when was 16, 15, 16? I hope to see him there. Another, another school friend who died in a car accident, 18 year old. When I was uh, in Amsterdam, uh, a young boy at the rugby club was 13, 14, run over by a bus. Atheist parents completely without hope, because that's all they had is this life. And when I assured them, I spoke to them and I said, you know what, I believe different things than you, and I find comfort in the fact that I look forward to see Jesper once, once I get there. They looked at me like, in, what are you talking about? But that is the hope that we live in. That Paul says, you know, our life, our hope in Christ is not just for this life. It is in the life to come that eternal life. I want to encourage all of us to, to spend some time to, to set our hearts and minds and, and not to be caught up too much in this world and the things of this world and, and make some time to think about that. Because that's what really matters. John ends off this passage by a, by a reminder in verse 27 to remain in him. Because by remaining in him, remaining in Jesus, that is where we find the confidence and the security and the surety in the grace of God that we will make it to that eternal life. That is what Christ died for. That is why his body was broken on the cross, why he was willing to spill his blood, why he not only died but was resurrected so that we can believe that yes, resurrection is real, life after this life is real. So that the apostles, when they saw him, could believe that, oh, it's not a ghost. It is Jesus who came to life again with a life after this life. And when we have the, the bread and the fruit of the vine, we have that to remind us. To remind us about this promise. To remind us to remain in Jesus. So, who will win this battle of Antichrist now versus Christ for eternity? Well, we know now will end, but eternity will never end. So only time will tell, but I know who my bet is on to win that battle. Um, Tunde, can you please come and pray for us for the convention?